Hi, Natalie here from Bula Heart Patterns and Sewing Magazine. Thank you for joining me on this, my very first sewing lesson. And today's lesson today, of course, is about getting to know your sewing machine so much better. We're going to be covering basic maintenance and, of course, basic functions. So if you ever wanted to get to know your sewing machine a little bit better, today's the day to do just that. Thank you so much for signing up and for the first 10 people who did sign up and take advantage of that early bird special, please check your inboxes. There is a gift that was emailed through to you for me to say thank you to you for signing up. So check your inbox and of course today I'm going to be giving you a lot of information during the course. So please have a notepad and pen handy to take notes and of course when you are taking notes please pause the video so I don't go on in the background and you lose some important information. So take those notes and take advantage of all the information I will be supplying you with today. Of course the videos will still continue to be available on Patreon for you to continue to refer back to as often as you need to. But that being said I am going to go a little slowly during today's class so if you would like to have your sewing machine in front of you as we go through the class please feel free to do so and as we go step by step you can follow with your sewing machine and I'll go slowly for you to be able to do so if you however at any point do feel I'm going too fast for you again feel free to push pause do what you'd like to do with your sewing machine and then continue okay so let's get started first of all let's introduce you to the ladies so these are my two sewing machines, my two babies. This is my finesse, she's well over 20 years old. She got me through college, of course I have a diploma in fashion design and dressmaking. So this is the machine that got me through college and helped me to get a, a number of distinctions on the way. So she's probably about 25 years old, I've had her for, for close to two decades. And then this is my new lady. I invested in her a few years ago as my business grew and she's my Alna 220. Both of these are basic machines on pretty much the same level and I wanted to share them with you so that you can see so how some machines parts and areas look a little bit different to others but the functions are primarily the same. So I wanted to share these with you so you can get an idea of perhaps something that's different on your machine that is not on mine. I just wanted to say that if there is anything on your machine after today's lesson that you are not sure about or if there's any questions you might have about today's lesson please feel free to email it through to me. I'll leave the email in the description below. So email me through your question or if you can a photograph of the part you are not sure of and I will try my best to answer you in the very next lesson and to respond to your pictures and queries in the very next lesson. So if there's anything I have to say you're still not sure about, please send me that email and then I will respond in next week's video as best as I can. Okay, so that being said, I would like to say I'm holding a little bit of a competition. I don't have a name for my sewing class. So, if you can come up with a wonderful creative name, pop it in the comments section below and before next week's class I will pick a winner and the winner will win a year's subscription to So You Magazine. So if you want to win that year's subscription, just pop your suggestion in the comment section below. Next week I will announce the winner and the winner will receive that year's subscription. Okay, so to start, we are going to start with a bit of basic maintenance for your sewing machine. Okay, so to start, we're going to be covering a bit of sewing machine maintenance. Now, this is a basic bit of maintenance that you would want to perform on your sewing machine every time you finish a really big sewing project or a couple of small ones. You want to do this to look after your sewing machine so it really lasts you a long time. Like I said, this old lady I've had for almost two decades and she is still going very, very strong. And that's because I make sure I take very good care of her. Now I start by 
using these cleaning brushes. Now when you buy your sewing machine, it usually comes standard with a small cleaning brush. What I do is I like to go down to my local haberdashery and invest in a pack of different shapes and size brushes so I really have a good set of brushes that I can use to clean out my sewing machine. So to start, always make sure you have a really good set of brushes and after a while these brushes the bristles do become a bit fragile and they start to break and you don't want them to break inside your sewing machine so make sure every couple of years at least you're replacing your brushes even if they don't seem too bad do replace your brushes because you don't want these bristles to break off inside your sewing machine okay so invest in a good pair of cleaning brushes and uh, that's what you'll be using to clean your sewing machine so to start you will be opening up your sewing machine and you'll be taking apart all the bits that will help you to clean it. So to start you will be taking out off your needle plate first. Every sewing machine comes with one or two little screwdrivers so you'll be grabbing the wide screwdriver and starting with that. So grab your screwdriver and the very first thing you're going to be doing is removing the needle plate. So take out your sewing needle. Remove your foot. And then take off this plate. You'll be quite surprised how much dirt actually sits underneath this plate. Go, two screws and then you'll have a look and you'll see the dirt that sits under the plate so give that a dust off and dust out any bits of fabric and debris that may be sitting underneath that plate really get to need all your different size brushes and clean everything that you need to Your next step is going to be to removing to remove this bobbin casing. So take your bobbin and your bobbin holder out. And take the casing out. It's usually quite easy to remove. Make sure you dust off all the pieces. Don't want any debris sitting in anywhere once you've done and neatly cleaned up. Let's take your brush and really get into your sewing machine as much as you can and remove all the dust and dirt and that you can. Get it all out. So once you've done that and you've cleaned your machine, then comes the fun part. When I was a little girl, I remember my mom was very good at cleaning her machine. My mom like myself as a seamstress, I'm a third generation seamstress. So my mom, my grand, my aunts, they all sewed. So I remember her cleaning her machine out quite frequently and she was very, very good with that. But she would also always, as she would clean, she would blow at her machine. So she would dust a bit with the brush and go and blow. And growing up, I obviously mimicked my mom and I did the same thing until a few years later I discovered it's actually very bad for your machine. You don't want to blow into your machine and get all that debris blown further into your machine and into your motor. So please, whatever you do, as you're cleaning your machine, don't blow away the dirt. Remember the rule, suck, don't blow. Rather, grab your vacuum cleaner and give your machine a really good vacuuming. You want to be able to suck out all the dirt that you can't reach. So once you've taken off your plate and out your bobbin and you've used a brush to clean out as much of the dirt as you can, Grab your vacuum cleaner and actually give your sewing machine a really good vacuum. So once you have finished cleaning your machine, you may find that you now want to oil your machine. And I'm going to 
start by saying I don't believe in oiling your sewing machine at all. My lady here, like I said, I've had it for two, almost two decades. I've never once oiled this machine. I've never once applied oil to her personally myself and yet she's still going very well of, you know, for almost 20 years. She has not let me down. She's an amazing little machine and I've never once oiled her at all. So oil, too much of a good thing? Very much so, especially if your sewing machine is under five years old or you have a digital sewing machine. Please, I'm going to ask you, please do not oil your machine. You really don't want to do it. And if you feel that you still really need to oil your machine, do refer to your user manual. It'll explain to you how often you need to oil your machine. The only time my machines ever get oiled is if she goes into a professional for a major service and then that professional person will be the only person who will oil my machine. Otherwise, I will never personally oil my machines. The reason for that being is quite often the only thing oil is good for is building up a residue and then it holds on to all the debris that is left over. So all this debris that you've just cleaned out your machine, if you had too much oil in your machine, no matter how much brushing or vacuuming you're doing, this is going to be held onto by your machine and eventually it's going to clog up and it'll make its way into your motor and burn out your motor and possibly do some other damage to your machine. So you really, my advice, don't oil your machine. However, if you do want to continue to oil your machine, I strongly recommend never applying the oil directly to your machine. Never apply the oil directly into your machine. Rather grab a cleaning brush, so you can have a brush that you put aside just for that purpose. Grab a cleaning brush, add a few drops of oil to the bristles of the brush and use the brush to sort of baste your machine and to apply it and to move it around. So once you've done that and you feel you have cleaned your machine, please take a dust rag and some furniture polish. And what you're going to be doing now is you're going to be polishing the outside of your machine. Never apply the furniture polish, please. Never apply it directly to your machine ever. Apply it to a rag first and then use this rag to wipe down your machine. The reason you want to be doing this is the furniture polish will help with any static and help prevent any debris lying around and any dust lying on your machine from then going back into your machine that you've just so nicely cleaned. So you want to take some furniture polish, apply it to a dust rag and then use that to wipe down the exterior of your sewing machine. Once you have done all of that, you will then be putting your plate back onto your machine. Okay, please remember to also clean up by the light here. If you have a machine like my finesse, where it opens up, it really does make life much easier. So you just open it up, give it a good dusting with your brush, and give it a good vacuum with your sewing machine, and you're good to go. However, if you have a machine like my Alna, you'll see this little plastic cover and a little screw. You just pop that out, remove the screw, And this will open up by your light and then you can then really dust and clean inside there. And once you've done that, once you've dusted and cleaned inside here, you pop it back on, you tighten the screw and you put your little plastic cap back on there. And that's also how you change the light. So do that. Make sure when you're cleaning, you clean up by the light as well. There are a lot of dust and debris does collect in there. Now just to show you a tip for when you are returning your bobbin case holder. Now everyone who's come to my class one-on-one -on -one knows that I've shown them this little trick and it really is worthwhile. 
First of all, if the lever for your foot is to the back of your machine, please make sure it is down so that you don't have it in the way when you're lying in your machine. So you can take your machine and literally lie her flat on her back. When she's lying flat on her back, grab the part to make up the bobbin holder. Insert the small part first and now you'll be able to see much more clearly exactly how it fits in. And then you insert the outer ring area. There we go. Make sure it's securely put back into place. And just like that, so much easier to insert your bobbin holder without any problems at all. Once you have done all of this, before you start your next sewing project, please sew a rag. By sewing a rag first, you're making sure that with your thread in that rag, you're catching any bit of debris that might have got caught somewhere that you didn't see. And it really helps you to clean out that your machine that last little bit. So please, before you, after you maintain your machine like this, before you do anything else, just sew a little test rag to make sure everything is nice and clean. Now, not all sewing machines are created equal. This is almost the bottom of the line sewing machines, but not quite. Uh, but they have most of the basic functions, or all the basic functions that we are going to go through. And it's really the functions that you need in order to be able to sew some really great garments. So it, all the functions we go through and that I'm going to be sharing with you are ones that I personally look for in a sewing machine. And that I personally feel I can achieve the most and the best projects with. And then there seems to be a bit of a growing movement towards people buying industrial sewing machines for their home. So why would you buy an industrial machine or a domestic machine? Personally, I prefer going for a domestic machine. First of all, it's much smaller, it's much lighter, you can pop it onto a tabletop and you can very, very easily pack it away. Second thing is the amount of functions you get. You get a lot more functions in a domestic sewing machine than you do an industrial sewing machine. Not only are industrial machines rather usually huge and quite bulky, but they normally only have one function. You can only do a straight stitch and you'll have to get a separate machine for a zigzag, a separate machine to apply zips, and a separate machine to do your buttonholes. Why would you want to spend thousands of rands on all these separate machines when you can quite simply buy one domestic machine that allows you to do all of the above? So absolutely, a domestic machine of an industrial machine for home use any day. So I'm going to go through now the basic requirements of what I look for in a sewing machine. Here we go, it has my two machines. Now the reason why I have them both out is for you to see what the different functions might actually look like on different machines. So first and foremost, the number one reason we all have a sewing machine is so we can do some straight stitching. And so you want to make sure your sewing machine has a standard straight stitch function. On my machine here, you can sew from, you can move the needle so you can sew from the left to the right, but there's your standard straight seam. And on my old finisha, there's only one standard straight seam over there. Now, if you want to figure out the type of stitches that you have on your machines and you're not too sure what's going on, usually the manufacturers are really good in helping us out. So they number and color everything and they put symbols everywhere so you can see what functions go together. So for example, on my finesse here, all the standard stitches are very easily visible in yellow. The buttonhole stitches are visible in green. The decorative stitches are in blue and the stretch stitches are in red. And all the dials everywhere, all over the machine, have different colours reflecting what the manufacturer suggests you use for those specific stitch functions. And here as well on this machine, it gives you two rows indicating different kinds of stitches. The third kind of stitch over here. And again on all the dials, it shows you and gives you symbols on what the manufacturer suggests you use for the different stitches. So if you get confused, it really is they try to make it as commonsensical as possible. Have a look at what the manufacturer has put out for you 
and use that as a guide. If you still get really stuck, please do use your user manual. It really is an invaluable source. In fact, I highly recommend you have a user manual with you as you are going through this video. First of all, you want your standard straight stitch. Then you want your standard zigzag stitches. So here's my zigzag stitches over here and my zigzag stitches over here. Once I know that the machine has zigzag stitches, I make sure it does buttonholes. So it has the buttonhole function over here and the buttonhole function over here. Just one machine up from the Explore 220 this is the Explore 240. It's a wonderful machine. It has a one-step buttonhole. So on both of these machines, I have a three-step buttonhole. That basically means I change the function myself as I sew each part of the buttonhole. But you do get machines that come out now that a one-step buttonhole. So what you do then is you literally push a button and the machine changes the functions automatically as to what part of the buttonhole it is sewing. So yes, it's a wonderful new addition, but it's not necessary. As long as you can make a buttonhole, you will be fine. Then, once you've got the buttonhole stitches, you want to see what stylized stitches you have. So as you can see, this machine actually has quite a few. It has in total 12 different stitches, including the straight and the zigzag. So it has 12 different stitches. So the top row here are your standard stitches, and the bottom row here are your stretch stitches. So you would change on this style, standard stitches to stretch stitches, and then you will change the number according to the type of stitch that you want to do. So this sewing machine gives you, so this sewing machine gives you 12 different stitches. This sewing machine gives me 17 different stitches. So it also has quite a few decorative stitches. Now both of these machines, part of the decorative stitches are an overlocking or surging stitch, which is a stretch stitch. So overlocking or surging stitch will automatically fall under your stretch stitch functions. And both of these machines come with those type of stitches. So that what that means is if I don't have an overlocker or a serger, I can quite simply cheat and use one of the stitches available to me on these sewing machines. So yes, stretch stitches are very important when you're sewing from home, especially if you decide that you're inspired to create your very own bathing suit for the first time. <laughs> but yes, stretch stitches are very handy. You could do a lot more. So yeah, I have quite a variety of stretch stitches that help me to create, like I said, overlocking and surging stitches to very decorative hemming stitches. And you can even use them almost as a type of embroidery. Both of these machines have fancy stitches that you can use in embroidery. So you can do a little bit of embroidery. Or if you want to, you'll use these stitches a lot in quilting. So if you are an avid quilter, then absolutely these are the kind of stitches that you're going to be looking out for. Then once you know you have quite a variety of stitches, you're going to look for your thread tension dial. So on this machine, this is the thread tension dial over here. And on this machine, this is the thread tension dial over here. On a lot of machines, it's actually a dial in the front that you can adjust. Or on more digital machines, you don't have that. The machine calculates the tension automatically for you. So on a basic machine like this, what your machine has is two or three little metal plates. But as you change the dial, those plates come closer or further apart and they hold on more tightly or more loosely to your thread. So if you have a look, you'll see there's a few loose thread tensions. So it's usually on here, it's from 0 to 1 and 2. 0, 1 and 2 are all loose threads. You'll be using this if you're going to be doing a very loose um, stitch, for example, if you're going to be gathering or just doing a basting stitch, that's what you're going to be using. And then the manufacturer will put a line along the area where it believes or highlighted in this case. So they will they are suggesting to you and recommending to you this the actual uh, the actual tension you will be using on your stitches. And on this machine there's a line with the, between three to five. So those are your, your sort of your medium tensions and the manufacturer is recommending that for every day ordinary stitching these are the tensions that you're going to be using and then you get a very tight tensions after that which you will use a lot less. So do have a look at how your manufacturers highlighted your numbers 
and you'll see which ones that they recommend for daily stitching. Again, playing around with your machine will help you to find your favorite tension, so to speak. Then once you know how to control the tension of your stitches, you're going to be looking at all your other dials. First and foremost is your reverse button. This is my reverse button here. And this is my reverse button here. For some machines, the reverse is on the side. So just have a look and see where your reverse has been set up. For other machines, there's a little dial that you would turn to get to reverse. Or a little, little sort of switch you would flick to the left or the right when you want to change from standard to reverse. And obviously you'll be do, using that function primi primarily when you are doing a reverse stitch, which you will be doing pretty much every time you start to seam. So you do want to know where that reverse dial is. And then you have your manual sewing dial. So basically that is the big round section, the big round dial here on the side of your machine. So that comes from the days when before electricity, when you'd actually hand sew. And you still can if you really wanted to. You can still use this dial to hand sew. You can go back and forth when you're doing your hand sewing. So the older vintage machines only had this option before they were before they had electricity. So you only had this option or a fancy sort of foot pedal that would do it for you. So that is what you will be using if say you run out of electricity, you have no electricity and you still want to continue on with your sewing project, this comes in quite handy. Thread spool holders. So these are your thread spool holders up here. Most sewing machines have two because you can actually have two threads running through your machine and you'll be able to stitch. You put a twin needle on and you'll be able to stitch with two threads. So check if your sewing machine has that function. If you have a look at my thread spool holder here, for example, you'll see I actually have a hole in there. And that hole is if I want to use a really large spool of thread. So you get those really big thread spools and you can get holders for them or you can have it loose. Put it behind your machine and thread it through this hole in your thread spool holder. And you just thread it through and then you thread your machine as you normally would. So this machine does allow you to practically use a much larger spool of thread. Then you have your bobbin winder. So this is your bobbin winder here made up of two parts. You've got your stopping mechanism which is adjustable so you'll see some parts of it are thicker and some parts of it are thinner and this stopping mechanism helps you to stop your bobbin winding at the thickness you want it to be. So this is your bobbin winder. You can quite literally push your bobbin in to put it into bobbin winding mode and out when you are done. And then the second part of the bobbin winder is usually this little spring clip so the spring clip here is part of a plate and here's my spring clip here. So this is two little plates, it's very similar to the tension dial here but a much smaller version. And this is quite literally just used for when you're winding your bobbin to help with the tension that you wind onto your bobbin. Then you have your stitch length dial, which on my machine over here is this one. So I have numbers one to four. And on my machine over here is this one, again, one to four. On this dial, I change the button, I change the button function, then I have the stitch length, and then I change the stretch function. Where on my one here, it has button function at the top, and then just the actual length of the stitch function. It changes automatically to straight stitch when I change this dial to the red stretch stitch functions. So this is your stitch length. And you'll be using that primarily when you are changing from a standard stitch again to say a basting stitch. I very seldom use the small stitches except for when I am doing buttonholes. That's the only time it comes in handy. Because if you stitch with too small a stitch, so if you're using a one or two and you're stitching really small, you might end up just weakening your fabric and causing damage to your fabric more than anything else. 
So my average stitch size, I usually stick to about a three. It's a really great size and a really great general size for everyday stitching. And then of course if I want to use my machine for a loose base stitch, I go all the way to the bigger size, which is a four, and that gives me a nice loose basting stitch, which I can use when I'm basting or gathering. So once I know the length of my stitches, I want to be able to control the width of my stitches. So on this machine, I can only control the width of the zigzag, and that is simply because on this dial, which is the only dial that allows me to change the width, it is the only stitch where it has more than one width. So my zigzag on this machine actually gives me four different widths. So this is where I will change the width. All the other machines are pretty much, all the other stitches are pretty much set in stone. You only have one width. On my machine here, however, I'm able to change the width with this style. The style is purely for the width. It also moves the position of the needle at the same time and allows me to create a really great width thread. So I can change this width and then I can change the type of stitch that I want. So this is where I would change the width and this is where I would change the type of stitch to match the width. So you can really play around with this and have wider versions of different kinds of decorative stitches or narrower versions or just use it to create narrower or wider stretch zigzag stitches. Next you're going to be looking for the dial that controls the pressure on your sewing machine foot. So that is the pressure on this foot down here. Now again a lot of sewing machines, especially beginner sewing machines don't have it but I always look for a machine that most definitely has this function. You want a machine that is going to be able to put more or less weight on your foot. Why? If you're dealing with delicate fabrics such as chiffons and satins, you really want this foot to be sitting you really want this foot to be sitting quite nice and lightly on your fabric. You don't want it to really hold it down because you can damage your fabric. At the same time, if you're working with something heavy like a denim or a really thick twill, you want to be able to put a lot of pressure on the fabric because it helps the needle go through a lot more easily. So on my ulna, there's actually a dial here on the side that allows me to change the setting of the pressure on the foot. Where on my finesse, and a lot of old machines have, the, have a dial that looks like this, you have this little metal dial. So if you ever wonder what this was for inside your casing by your light, it is what controls the pressure on your sewing machine foot. Now some of the older machines have this a set of two small of two metal rings that you'll find on the top and literally one clips down into the other so you clip it down to put a lot of pressure on your foot and then you push down on the outer ring and the inner ring pops up and that lifts the pressure on your foot so if you wonder what that is for it's just for controlling the pressure on your foot and some machines actually have it looks like a little plastic screwdriver with numbers on sorry a little plastic screw with numbers on and then you just take a screwdriver that comes with your machine and you loosen or tighten the pressure of your foot that way. Then next is your sewing needle holder. So this is the area on this machine, your sewing needle holder. Then you have your plate with your measurements on. So this is your sewing plate and you'll see some machines actually have the measurements on them that guide your seam allowance. So for example on my ulna it clearly shows where 15 millimeters or 5 eighths of an inch is and as well as narrower and thicker so I can use this as a seam guide. Where on my finesse it just has lines so if you have lines in your place you've always wondered what they're for because there's no numbers it is to guide your seam allowance. If you're not too sure where your seam allowance is so a standard seam allowance is 15 millimeters or 5 eighths of an inch. So if you're not too sure where that is on your plate, take a ruler and from the center of your foot where your needle comes down outwards, measure the distance. And 15 millimeters or 5 eighths of an inch is usually the second or third line on your plate. And that's your standard seam allowance. So some machines come with a seam guide. 
So if you see on some machines there's a little hole there, it looks like you might be missing a screw and on here it's over here. Because some machines come with, it looks like a little metal arm with a screw that you can adjust. And what you do is you screw it into your machine that is a seam allowance guide. So you can adjust it to how far or wide you want your seam to be. Most machines, however, don't come with a seam allowance guide. And I've noticed of late there's a tendency for people to actually sellotape Lego blocks to their sewing machines and using the Lego blocks as a seam guide. Please, I'm asking you so nicely, please don't tape anything to your machine purely because the glue on the tape is not good for your machine and if it does get stuck on your machine it can even damage your fabric going forward. So whatever you do, please don't tape anything to your machine. Rather go to your hardware store, your haberdashery and get a magnet. All of these plates are metal and magnetic and you can actually get a magnet that you use to use as a seam allowance. So this here is an actual magnet that is used as a seam allowance guide. So this is one or two dollars. They are very cheap to get. You also get plastic versions, but I like this metal version. So this is your seam allowance guide and you literally can just put it onto your plate wherever you want your seam to be and it'll help you to sew nice straight stitches and they really really are very inexpensive please don't tape anything to your machines then you get your bobbin casing all machines come with a bobbin casing some machines come with spare ones so you might get one or two of these when you get your sewing machine and these quite literally hold your bobbin insert your bobbin you lift this little piece here and it locks your bobbin into place and that allows you to put your bobbin in your machine without it falling out. So you quite literally take your bobbin, so you take your bobbin, you slide it into your bobbin casing, you turn your bobbin casing and you grab that little piece and then you see it's locked in. That bobbin is not going to fall out. And then you can now securely take it and put it in your sewing machine without any problems whatsoever. And it always does come in handy because these do eventually rust and get a bit stiff or the spring gives way in there. So it does actually come in handy to have one or two of these extra and you should be able to buy them for relatively inexpensively at your local haberdashery. And then finally, all sewing machines. There's a few very starter machines that don't have these, but when I look for a sewing machine, I always make sure it has a little tool case. So for example, in the case of my ulna, this is the arm extension, and it's literally built into the arm extension, and there's a the little tool case that came with it. Okay. For my finesse, the arm extension also has the tool case, and it literally slides off and out. So if you want to have your tool case ready for you while you're working, you don't necessarily want to take your arm off every time, you can take this off. And when you're done, just clip it back and slide it back and it's neatly packed away. You can quite often buy tool cases separately and in some machines, tool cases are even in the top part of the machine. So it really depends on the type of machine you have as to where your little tool case is going to be if you have one. So I want to cover with you very quickly your feeder plate. So your feeder is this section here. It's, it's a very rough grip section on your sewing machine and it's a moving part. And what it does is as you're sewing it comes along it takes your fabric and grabs hold of it and helps to feed it through and keep it going straight in your machine and it makes your sewing life a lot easier. So you'll see as it moves along it'll move according to the length of your stitches and how fast you're going. On some machines it's possible to switch off the function of this plate. So basically what you can do is you switch it off and you would use that primarily for when you are quilting or doing a decorative freehand where you don't want to have your fabric controlled and going a very specific direction. 
So if you don't want your fabric to be controlled going in a very specific direction and you want to be able just to sort of freehand stitch which is usually decorative and used primarily in quilting then you would want to be able to switch off this little feeder plate so that it doesn't move your fabric along for you. So I just wanted to cover with you very quickly the three types of standard feet you should always always make sure it comes with your sewing machine. The first is this, it looks like it's a very standard foot or your machine come with it and it's actually called the zigzag foot. Traditionally machines only came with a straight stitch foot which if you look at this, let me zoom in here very quickly for you. So if you look at this foot you see there's just a, a line there. So the straight stitch tradition would just have just that line and it wouldn't have the space for the needle to go back and forth or it would have just one single hole in the middle big enough just for the needle to go through to stitch a straight stitch. So those feet you don't see very much anymore and sewing machines very much come standard with these zigzag feet now. Then we have our zipper feet, which are these feet over here. So this is a zipper foot that came with my finesse. It does have ridges in for the zipper teeth to go underneath, but I do find that even with this little section that comes out, the zip still catches on it. So my favorite type of zipper foot is this one. And you'll see it's one of the few feet you get with the arm already attached so when you change this on your machine you're going to be changing the full arm and not just the lower piece of the foot which we'll go through shortly. So this is a zipper foot and this is my favorite type of zipper foot. It's adjustable at the back so you can adjust to which side of the zipper you're, zipping, you're sewing and then you can sew on either side of the zipper foot. You'll see that there are holes and indents on either side for the needle to go through. So those are your zipper feet. Then these are your buttonhole feet. So this is more your sort of vintage style buttonhole foot. You get more modern versions of these and that's the sort of foot you would use on a machine that has a one step buttonhole. So it'll be doing all the work for you and then this will be the kind of foot that you put on it. And then these are your more typical type of buttonhole feet that you'll get. And you'll see they have measurement gauges on the side to help you measure the size of button that you're going to be inserting. So let me show you quickly how you change the foot on your sewing machine. So it's really easy. So here I have a buttonhole foot on my sewing machine and I want to change it to put the standard zigzag foot on. So I literally just push the quick release, the foot drops, I take the new foot, I line it up with the ridge underneath, I lower the lever and it clips on. And just like that, my foot is very securely attached. Most modern feet you get these for your sewing machine are really this easily interchangeable. If you get a little more detailed foot such as the zipper foot where it has the arm already attached, you then will need your hand little screwdriver and you just loosen this really big screw on the side until your foot drops and you take out the old foot attach the new foot and tighten it up always make sure you tighten it up very securely And not just by hand, always use your, your little screwdriver to give it that extra twist just to make sure your foot is not going to come off while you're sewing. So really it's that easy to change the feet on your sewing machine. So if you want to go back to the original neck and foot, you just undo the screw again. It helps when you are reapplying, because this neck is quite tricky, it helps if you use your lever to lift your foot up just a little bit higher. So you'd have to do it by hand, so just lift your foot a little bit higher, insert your foot, and then drop it down all the way. So you lift it, so you lift it higher, 
insert the arm of your foot and then just drop it down all the way. The reason you're dropping it down all the way is because this will actually hold your arm in place while you tighten your screw. It's not fighting it. Okay? Then once your arm is in place, attach the foot you will be using. And just like that, it's very, very easy to change the foot on your sewing machine. The next thing we're going to cover is putting in a sewing needle. So 99% of the time the problems you have with your stitches are because your sewing needle has actually been put in incorrectly or you're using the wrong sewing needle. So this is a fairly standard sewing needle. If you look at it, you will see it has a flat side. And then if you look at the back, there's a little, little bump at the back. And at the front of the needle, there's a ridge down the front going towards the hole. So this ridge is basically just a sort of little uh, feed for your sewing thread to make sure your thread runs smoothly into the hole there. So when you're inserting your sewing machine needle, when you're inserting your needle, you want to make sure that the flat part of your sewing needle is always facing towards the back of your sewing machine. If you have a sewing needle that is purely round, which is quite common, especially with Singer machines, then you're going to go by just the ridge in the front. You'll see that the ridge in the front of the needle must always face the front of your sewing machine. So when inserting it, make sure that the ridge, which is a little thread guide, faces the front of your machine. And if you have a flat section on your needle, that will be against the back. So then you have this little screw and that's what's going to be holding your needle in quite securely. So take your foot, make sure it's dropped all the way down. This just gives you the space to be able to work. Insert your needle into that space. And then just make sure, just give it a double check that it is absolutely facing the right way. If you're 100% happy, that it's facing the right way, then, turn, then tighten this little screw until it holds your needle quite securely. And that is how you change a sewing needle. If at any point you find your needle is blunt or you're changing your needle because of a change of fabric, just quite the reverse. You loosen it here, take it out and put a new fresh needle in. How to insert a bobbin. This is something we covered briefly earlier, but let me show it to you again. So you get the little bobbin case that comes with your sewing machine. And it looks something like this. So you literally take it, you pop your bobbin in like that. So here is a bobbin that's got three on it already, so you put your bobbin in. Okay, then you take it. And you'll see there's a little slit in there, so you take the thread, you guide it through that slit, and then you just pull it until it clips into the hole along the top of the bobbin case. And once it's done that, take this little lever and pull it out, and it secures your bobbin in place. Now, a lot of people may ask, should your button be going clockwise or anti-clockwise? For most machines, it doesn't really make a difference. The biggest machines it makes a difference with is the machines where the bobbin is actually inserted onto the top of the plate here. So some machines you insert your bobbin in on the top of the machine. And if that's the case, just read your user manual. If I remember correctly, your bobbin should be moving anti-clockwise. So in this case, if I was to take my bobbin thread and just the way the bobbin, the thread is wound on the bobbin, if I move it around, it's anti-clockwise. But if you're inserting at the bottom, most of the time it doesn't really matter which way your bobbin is facing. But if you want to be safe, go with anti-clockwise. Okay. So then take your bobbin, insert it in, release, and then it's in there quite nice and securely. 
Let me cover with you very briefly how to wind up a bobbin. So as I'd mentioned earlier when we're going through the functions of the machine, this is your bobbin winder. So you'll see there's actually a spring mechanism on the, bo the bobbin winder itself. So you see there's a little spring mechanism at the top of the bobbin winder. And on the bobbin itself, there is a little slit, a little hole at the opening of the actual bobbin. So you can see there's a little slit. The design is that this spring mechanism slips into that hole. And the reason for that is it prevents your bobbin from going flying while you're busy winding it up. So you're going to take your bobbin and you're going to slide it onto the bobbin winder and then just twist it until you have that clip and then you know it's securely clipped into that little spring. Now when you take your bobbin and you move it towards the stopper, you're then taking your machine and you're putting it into bobbin winding mode. So my machine is now in bobbin winding mode. Now for most machines in order to switch off the stitching function, you would work here by the handle. So a lot of machines actually have a two-part uh, wheel here. So you hold the outer wheel still and turn the inner wheel until it comes loose. And when it is loose, what you are actually doing is switching off the stitching function. So this arm won't move and you switch off the stitching function on your sewing machine. For my ulna, I simply clip it out and then my stitching function is now officially switched off. So I'll just take a nice new roll of thread so I take the thread I feed it around the little spring mechanism this helps to control the tension as you're winding your thread onto your bobbin. And then I just wind it around a few times really tightly just to secure it. Now what you can do, if you see your bobbin has a hole in the top. So your bobbin may have a hole in the top of it like this. And the reason is for that is you can take your thread, feed it through that hole and tie a knot and then it's supposed to make your winding of your bobbin and catching your thread much easier. Personally, I don't like to do that. The reason being is when you reach the end of your bobbin, it gives it a real jerk and you can often snap your needle or damage your fabric. So I personally don't like to do that. I don't tie the knot and not the, fabric, the thread onto my bobbin itself. So I just really take it and wind it around tightly a few times. And then once it is set up like this, I make sure my stopper is as thick as I want it to be. All I have to do now is put foot. What I do while my thread is winding onto my bobbin, I just very lightly place my finger above the main spool of thread. The reason for this is just to keep it on the machine so that it doesn't go flying off. Don't push too hard down, otherwise it won't be able to wind properly or you'll get burn marks on your finger and that's quite unpleasant. So just lightly hold your finger there just to prevent the thread from jumping off. And away we go. And just like that, my bobbin is fully wound. Now we're going to go on to the threading of the sewing machine. So most sewing machines will be threaded from right to left. Some of the more vintage sewing machines you thread from left to right. But that's very, very old vintage machines. Most of them these days you thread from right to left. The threading concept is pretty much the same. This one or two things might look different, but you're doing the same thing as you go along. So it's really quite easy. Most of your machines will be numbered and have arrows to show you which way to go. And you just follow the numbers in order. So you start at number one 
and then you end up at the last number on your machine. Okay, so now we're going to thread the machine. So you take your thread, take it on the first loop, then you're going to go down through the tension, the thread tension dial. For some of you, the dial will be in the front, and so you're going to go around the dial and come back up and feed it, and just pull the thread back slightly and hear a click, you know it's in place. But on this machine you go down, you follow, you see I have a little arrow that goes, says go back up and I go back up. On this side, on the top of the foot for the sewing needle, there is this little catchment. So you're going to catch that and what this does is it helps to control your stitches so that your stitches don't get all messy and chaotic. So feed it through that, go back down and then usually these one or two little catchments at the bottom, I've got two, so I literally catch my thread on those and that is how my thread is threaded through my sewing machine and my sewing machines work very similarly. And then now all I need to do is thread the actual needle. So I'm very spoiled, I have this nice little gadget, this little arm on my machine and what it is, it's a self-threading arm. So it has a little metal clip on it and that little metal clip goes through the eye of my needle and catches my thread and pulls it through. So just like that, my needle is very nicely threaded. So the next step would be to catch that bobbin thread. Okay, so I've just zoomed in here for you so you can see how I do that. So you're going to lift your foot, you're going to make sure that your thread is to the back of your foot and with one hand hold the thread to the back of your machine because you don't want it to come back. And with your hand dial, turn the... make sure it's in sewing mode again. Turn the needle till it goes down and back up and what it does there is it loops and catches that bobbin thread then you just need something small to pull that thread through and to the top and just like that both your threads are now at the top of your machine and to the back and you are ready to sew Okay, so to finish off today's lesson, before we end, I would like to cover a few reasons why perhaps your stitches aren't quite looking the way that they should. So you've set up your machine and you've sewn a test piece of fabric, but for some reason your stitches just aren't right. So I'm going to cover the top five reasons as to why this actually happens. So. Reason number one, you are stitching along but you see that your top thread isn't quite uh, catching your bottom thread properly. So what you do is when you turn your fabric upside down and look at the seam from the back end, you have a bunch of loops with a loose thread running through it. Or you turn around and you just see a whole lot of loops that have happened and you don't know what is going on there. The main reason for that happening is the tension on your sewing thread is not correct. So quite simply and very easily to adjust that problem all you've got to do is change the tension on your thread. So change it up to a tighter and tighter one and stitch a little bit as you go along until you find the tension that is correct for your sewing project. Different fabrics will require different tensions so feel free to play as you go along. The second problem and probably the most common problem and the number one reason why sewing machines end up going for a major service is because your top thread is just not catching your bottom thread. So you're stitching along and you've sewn for a while and you real realize that actually no stitching has happened whatsoever or you do stitch but there are big gaps in between where the stitches have not caught and it's just these big pieces of thread where there are actually no stitches. And the number one reason for that is your sewing needle. You do not have the right sewing needle in your machine or your sewing needle is put in incorrectly 
or you have a blunt and old sewing needle. So first things first, make sure your sewing needle has been put in correctly. If you're absolutely certain your sewing needle has been put in correctly, make sure you have the right sewing needle for the job, stretch needle for stretch fabric, denim needle for denim fabric, etc. So make sure you have the right needle for the fabric that you are working with. And if you have the right needle and your needle is installed correctly, then your problem is more than likely that your needle is old and blunt. So change it out for a brand new needle and chances are quite high you'll be sewing just fine thereafter. Okay, so if after you've done that, you find that as you're sewing along, suddenly your fabric is clumping and creating a knot right here below the foot and pulling it under your feeder plate. So you're just getting a big knotty mess. The number one reason for that happening is you actually have the wrong bobbin for your machine. So you're using either a plastic bobbin, which should be using a metal one, or vice versa. Or remember, different machines require different bobbins. If I'm not mistaken, single machines require the smallest bobbins. So have a look at the actual bobbin you are using for your bottom thread. If you are getting a lot of knots forming, it could be because you have the wrong bobbin in your machine. The other reason that quite often happens is you haven't threaded your machine correctly. So that will also happen if your machine is incorrectly threaded. So if you've made sure you have the correct bobbin in your machine, just check that you have threaded your machine correctly. And if you're not too sure, do check your user manual, it will help you with that. And of course, finally, if after you have done all of that and taken all the precautions and nothing seems to be working, it could very well be that gremlins have moved into your machine and you need to take it for a proper professional service. So the bobbin, the incorrect bobbin and the incorrect sewing needle are the number one reason why people end up taking their machines for services when they think something is wrong where really you've just put the wrong attachments on your machine. So please double check that first before panicking and rushing off to your local sewing machine service provider. From next week I would like to mention so next week's class is going to be a really interesting and exciting class. We're going to be covering the different kinds of seams that you can sew and the different kinds of seams that you can create. So there's a lot of information once again and you really, really don't want to miss out on it. But at the same time, I am going to be using these very, the next few classes to create a handbag. And the image of the handbag is going to come up on the screen now. So if you would like to make this very cute little handbag with me, I will leave in the description below the details of what you would need to buy to make the handbag work for you. So it's going to be a yard or a meter of fabric. Try a poly cotton. It's a really great fabric to practice on and to get to know your sewing machine better. So grab a meter or a yard of poly cotton, a meter or a yard of decorative ribbon. You would want some sewing thread to match and a 15 centimeter or 6 inch stand dress zip. And to finish off you will also need an A4 page or letter size page of project cardboard. So grab those items. It's not necessary if you don't want to make the bag with me, you don't have to. But if you do, you can grab these items and come and join me. If you don't want to make the bag, come to the lesson anyway because over the next few lessons as we do make the bag there's still going to be a lot of information that you are going to learn even if you aren't making the bag with me. So come and join me with that next week and we'll get started on making our bags. And of course, as I mentioned at the beginning of the video, if you have any queries or parts of your machine that you're not sure of, please feel free to send an email and take pictures and email it to me and ask me what is going on. And I will try my absolute best to answer it as best as I can in the very next video. So until next time, thank you so much for joining me and happy sewing!